How Georgie Radburn Saved Baseball by David Shannon. It was winter in America when Georgie Radburn was born. It was always winter. Year after year, snow covered the factories, fields, and houses from New York to St. Louis to Los Angeles. The entire country was freezing cold, for this was a time when baseball had been declared illegal. And the strange thing was that without baseball, spring didn't come, and the snow didn't melt, and the sky stayed gray. But it hadn't always been like this. Long, long ago, many years before Georgie was born, there had been four seasons in America, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Every April, the nation had celebrated spring with the opening of baseball season. Baseball was the national pastime. The ballparks were packed, and folks rooted for their favorite teams all summer long. But one year, a young ball player named Boss Swaggart was in a terrible slump. Fans who once had cheered for him now booed when he came to bat, and the more the crowds jeered, the meaner Boss Swaggart's heart became. One day, Boss was at the plate, and the bases were loaded. This was his chance to win the game and be the hero. In came the pitch, but with a colossal swing, the mighty Boss struck out again. The fans booed him mercilessly. You bum, they yelled. You get out of here. Boss stormed off the field. He vowed he would never play baseball again. And someday, if he had his way, no one would. This is Boss Swaggart here. Years passed and Boss Swaggart worked hard and became a very rich man. But even with all his money, he never forgot that rotten day at the ballpark so long ago. He thought about it day and night, and he cooked up a plan to rid America of baseball forever. Boss used his money to buy radio and television stations and newspaper companies and magazines. Every day, folks read about the evils of baseball in his papers or heard about them on his radio and TV shows. Look at how angry that guy is, huh? He made great windy speeches to great noisy cow to big noisy crowds. <laughs> Millions of people are starving while baseball players are making millions, he bellowed. Let's tear down the ballparks and build factories instead. Then everyone will have jobs. Pretty soon, Boss Swaggart had the whole country believing that life in America would be good only if baseball were outlawed once and for all. Then Boss bought lots of expensive presents for all the politicians. His power grew and grew. Finally, he even managed to have the president arrested for conspiracy to commit baseball. The president couldn't deny he'd thrown out the first ball of the season. Boss Swaggart then declared himself chief, chief executive officer of America and outlawed baseball completely. There's a fire down here for various things of baseball. Right off the bat, Boss threw out threw all the ball players in the freezing cold candlestick prison and he confiscated all the baseball equipment. Next, he outlawed the shape of the baseball diamond and even made baseball sayings illegal. People were locked up just for calling someone a screwball or for saying a movie was a hit. Out came the bulldozers, down came the ballparks, and up went a new set of factories. Boss put everyone over the age of eight to work in those factories, and he gave them all paychecks each week. He formed a gang of thugs called the Factory Police, and he used them to spy on the public. Take the cover off that. He's a tyrant. Now, Ebert and Mary Radburn were simple folks, and like everyone else, they were happy at first. They agreed when people said, "Boss Swaggart's right. It's only a game. Who needs it when we can have all the all have more money instead?" But then April rolled around, and May, and June, and still the weathermen said, "More seasonably." cold temperatures and continued snow flurries tomorrow. Trees stayed bare. Flowers didn't bloom, birds didn't sing, and winter went on and on, even in places like San Diego, where it had never been cold. And as icy months turned into freezing years, even those jobs everyone had been so crazy about didn't seem to accomplish much, except to make Boss Swaggart richer. Without baseball and spring to lift their spirits, the people became tired and sad. Ebbett and Mary hoped that the coming birth of their child would bring a little light into their lives. It's Ebbett and, and Mary. 
George Rab Georgie Radburn was born in April during what bosses' newspapers called the mother of all snowstorms. Ebert, Ebert and Mary were very proud of their baby boy, but as he grew older and began to talk, they discovered something truly odd about him. Every time he opened his mouth to speak, forbidden sayings of baseball popped out. Batter up, he would shout, followed by, hum that apple, shoot that pea. What he meant was, good morning, for what, what's for breakfast? Ebbett and Mary didn't know what to do. Secret trips to sympathetic doctors produced no answers. It's a freak of nature, the doctors said, scratching their heads. Georgie tried to hold his tongue. His parents were afraid of the factory police, and he made the neighbors nervous. But as time passed, a growing number of people began to feel that there was something special about the boy, as if his strange affliction might somehow save them from their misery. And they hid him from the eyes and ears of Boss Swaggart's men. With winter everywhere and baseball just a memory, the only fun left for children in America was throwing snowballs. Georgie and his friends found that the factory police made the most thrilling targets. Hit them where they ain't, Georgie yelled, and his friends let loose a snowy barrage. Then they ran. Georgie was the best. He was super fast and deadly accurate, and he could throw snowballs that curved around the corners of buildings, catching the cops off guard. <laughs> All too soon, it was Georgie's ninth birthday, and he was ordered to report for work at the factory. His parents panicked. How could they keep this baseball talk a secret? Finally, they thought of a plan. We'll wrap your face in bandages, Mary said, and we'll tell the supervisor you had an accident with the stove. Ebbett tried to console his son. It won't be any fun, he told Georgie, but it's a lot better than being caught by the factory police. The plan worked fine for three weeks, but one day Georgie was working near his mother when the deadly gears of the factory machinery caught her skirt and started to pull her in. Without thinking, Georgie tore off his bandages and yelled a warning. No hitter, was what, he, was what came out. His mother turned just in time to wrench free, but in the next instant, Georgie was surrounded by the factory police. There's Georgie there. Mother's skirt got caught in the machine. Trial of the century, screamed the newspaper headlines, and the whole country was abuzz with rumors, hopes, and whispers. No one as young as Georgie had ever been arrested before. Adding to the excitement was the news that Boss Swaggart had declared himself the judge and the jury. On the day of the trial, crowds overflowed down the prison courthouse steps, and people filled the streets for blocks and blocks. The courtroom was in an uproar. Every time Georgie opened his mouth to plead innocent, something illegal came out. Line drive back through the box, he shouted, and going, going, gone! Judge Swaggart ordered the boy gagged, and he slammed his gavel on the bench. By now, the crowd was chanting, Georgie, Georgie! Order, order! Boss shouted, and his face was as red as a hot dog. Georgie's lawyer approached the judge. Your Honor, she began, my client is very sorry, and he would like to offer a proposal to settle this matter quickly. The courtroom became quiet. My client proposes a simple contest of wits and skill. Oh, said Boss, warming to the challenge, and what might be the nature of this contest? The lawyer hesitated. A, uh, pardon my language, a baseball game. A gasp rippled through the crowd. If Georgie Radburn can strike you out on three pitches, you will free him and once again make baseball the national pastime. At this, a roar went up from the crowd, the likes of which had not been heard since the old bar parks were bo ballparks were bold bulldozed. Boss Swaggart snickered. This pipsqueak couldn't whiff me in a million years, he thought. I used to be a famous hitter. I accept the offer, he announced with a sly grin, and if I should manage a hit, he paused to lean so far over the bench that his pockmarked potato nose was inches from the boy's face. I will cut out his treacherous tongue and throw him and his parents into prison for the rest of their lives. Let's get on with it, he roared. With that, the whole mob spilled out the side doors into the snowy prison yard. The crowd settled in on either side, and foul lines were drawn in the snow. A bat and ball were brought out from the great piles of equipment that had been locked up for years. Georgie was filled with wonder at the sight of his first real baseball. He turned it over in his hand and smelled the horse hide. 
he felt as if he'd found a part of himself that had always been missing. As the big man and the small boy took up their positions, the people, inspired by Georgie, began to root openly against Boss. Give him the high hard one, kid! Backdoor the mum! It felt good to shout out these words, to root for their favorite ball player again. Boss dug in, wiggled his big, round backside, and cocked a huge eyebrow. Georgie glanced at his mother, went into his windup, and let the ball fly. Boss could hear the hum of the ball's stitches as he swung wildly and missed. Strike one, bellowed the umpire, and the crowd exploded. Boss swaggered, was livid. He rolled up his sleeves and glared out at the small pitcher. Let's see that again, he hollered. Georgie wound up and fired another fastball, but this time Boss was ready. He swung hard, and there was the smell of burning wood as the bat met ball. The crowd groaned as the ball soared high and deep toward the prison wall. But wait, it was curving. Curving. Foul ball, strike two. Boss Swigert grinned. This wouldn't end like that game so many years ago. He had this kid's number. He leaned out towards Georgie, stuck out his big ugly tongue, and made a chopping motion with his hand. Georgie was unruffled. He stared in at Boss, expressionless. Again, he wound up, and again, he delivered the pitch, straight, true, and fast. Boss cocked his bat and stepped into the pitch. In unison, the crowd yelled, Swing! And Boss, and swing Boss did, as hard as he could. But this time, as the ball rocketed toward home, it curved like no one had ever seen, even in the glory days. It curved as if it were rounding the corner of a building. Boss missed it by a mile, and the force of his swing blew him out of his shirt and his tie, out of his pinstripe pants, and even out of his size 14 wingtip shoes. Strike three, you're out of here, yelled the umpire. He ripped himself out of his clothes. And then a wonderful thing happened. As the crowd leapt to its feet and Boss crumpled in a heap on home plate, the steely cover of clouds broke open, and the sun came streaming through like a ball club taking the field to start a new season. The snow melted away to reveal a shimmering green baseball diamond. The people swarmed onto the field and lifted Georgie to their shoulders. Long hidden bats and balls were pulled out of attics and out from behind stairways. Play ball, shouted Georgie, and everybody did. And so, today, there is baseball in America once again. There is still winter, but now there is spring and summer, and autumn too. And there are still jobs to do, only now, some of them are at the ballpark. Who's that? <laughs> Boss Swagger, selling peanuts. <laughs> nice. And he looks happy too, doesn't he? That's a nice story. That's called Georgie Radburn. <laughs> Get the cover again. How Georgie Radburn saved baseball. And today we're at a baseball field. And you can see, can you imagine Georgie Radburn down there striking out Boss Swagert? Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye bye.